Sister Claire Crockett, servant sister of the home of the mother, alone with Christ alone. Chapter 4, First Encounter with Christ Alone Dressed in her school uniform, a green skirt and jumper, over a white shirt and a tie, and accompanied by a few friends, Claire rang the doorbell of the Gallagher's house. Sharon had told her earlier that morning to come by to pick up the plane tickets for Spain. She still couldn't believe it. A free trip to sunny Spain, ten days of beaches and parties. As she talked to her friends about how much fun she was going to have, Sean opened the door and welcomed them into the living room where a group of people was praying the rosary. Claire and her friends burst into the room laughing, but they immediately fell silent when they saw what was happening. Claire's eyes quickly scanned the room. There were about 30 people and the majority were her parents' age or even older. And what was that in their hands? A rosary? No way. She also saw two nuns in white habits and two young women in skirts. Although she was afraid to hear the answer, she could not help but ask, Are you all going to Spain? They responded enthusiastically. Aye, we're going on the pilgrimage. The what? Claire stammered desperately as her eyes fell on her friend Sharon, who was sitting over to the side. Claire quietly sneaked over to her. What's going on here? Is this thing religious, is it? Sharon whispered, Claire, I forgot to tell you, but it's in a monastery. They're the nuns who are going to be there with you. They've come to meet everyone who's going. There's no way I'm going, no way, Claire responded resolutely. But Claire, you've got to, Sharon insisted. Your name is already on the ticket and it's already paid for. It wouldn't be very nice if you just step out and waste all that money. It isn't yours. Not yet willing to recognise that Sharon was right, Claire sat down next to her forgetful friend as the group continued on with their rosary. The sisters then stood up and explained what would be done on the pilgrimage. As soon as they were finished, everyone started chatting about how much they looked forward to the trip. Although still upset about the whole situation, Claire was not going to let her friends die of boredom as the adults went on with their devotional small talk. She jumped to her feet, attracting all the attention to herself and ceremoniously pulled a lollipop out of her pocket. She proceeded to use it as if it were a microphone and with a grave and professional look on her face, she began her performance. Excuse me, would you be willing to say a few words here for the BBC? Claire asked the first, losing her composure for a moment as she and her friends laughed at the man's initial surprise. He good-naturedly acquiesced and she proceeded with the first question. I have heard that you're going on a trip to Spain in the following weeks. What do you expect? The sisters have come to explain everything and it really looks brilliant. We'll be in Priego in a monastery for Holy Week and then we'll be going up to Lourdes and a few other places. Are you going to pray the rosary? Claire asked. Of course, the man responded. Claire flashed him a phony smile and turned round towards Sharon, squinting her eyes and slowly shaking her head. Instantly returning to her television smile, she took a step towards a very pious-looking lady. Hello, we're here from the BBC. Would you be willing to say a few words into the microphone? Thomas Gallagher, the organiser of the COR youth group in Derry, came to know the home of the mother through his brother Sean. Sean had met the servant priests and brothers on a trip to Garbundal, a site of Marian apparitions in northern Spain. Some of the brothers and sisters were then invited to Derry to meet with their prayer group, giving testimony in local schools and parishes. Both Sean and Thomas were very impacted by the charism of this new community in the church. The home of the mother, the brothers and sisters explained to them, is the gift that our Lord wishes to make to his mother. The three missions of the home of the mother also stood out to them. The defence of the Eucharist, the defence of the honour of our mother, especially in the privilege of her virginity and the conquest of young people for Jesus Christ. The home of the mother organises a retreat every year during Holy Week for families and young people to help them commemorate the passion, death and resurrection of Christ in close union with the Lord and his Blessed Mother. After hearing about the retreat that the home of the mother was organising in Spain during Holy Week of the Jubilee year 2000, Sean and Thomas decided to help organise a group from Ireland. It was only natural that they made sure to encourage young people from their youth group to attend. The adults were very generous and helped to pay for the young people's tickets. 
Sharon Doherty, one of Claire's two friends who had invited her to COR a year before, signed up for the trip. However, a few weeks beforehand, her appendix burst and she had to immediately go to the hospital for surgery. Since she was no longer going to be able to travel, the COR leaders approached her and asked if she wanted anyone to go in her place. Claire was the first person to come to her mind and Sharon immediately phoned to ask her if she wanted to go. Claire tells the conversation in her own words. One day, my friend Sharon Doherty called me and said, Claire, do you want to go to Spain? It's all paid for. I thought, a free trip to Spain, 10 days of partying in the sun of Spain. So I said, of course I'll go. When Claire realised it was a pilgrimage, it was too late to get out of the trip. She knew it would have been rude to drop out in the last minute. She had a second encounter with the servant sisters the morning after the meeting at the Gallagher's house. They made a visit to her secondary school and spoke to groups of students throughout the morning. Claire wanted to get out of sociology class, so she went with some of her friends to see the sisters. What surprised them the most were the two young women from Ireland who accompanied the sisters and who wanted to be sisters themselves. After the talk, Claire and her friends stopped them in the hallway and asked them loads of questions. Why are you wearing that skirt? Why don't you have earrings on? Can you go out to the pub? One of the two shared her story with the girls and they were very impacted to see how God could call such a regular person. Three weeks later, on Wednesday, April 19th, Sharon went out to say goodbye to Claire and the other pilgrims as they got on the bus in Derry to ride to the airport in Belfast. As she waved to Claire, who was already seated on the bus, Sharon jokingly held on to her side as if to indicate pain in her appendix. Claire very clearly articulated the words, you're dead, as she made a gesture with her right hand as if slitting her throat. Sharon thought to herself with a laugh, thank goodness she's away because I couldn't cope with her right now. After a brief layover in Brussels, the group arrived in the Madrid airport and a bus took them to the very small town of Priego in the province of Cuenca, Spain, where the Monastery of St. Michael of the Victories is located. When the bus full of Irish pilgrims arrived, the sisters and brothers all came out to welcome them. It was quite late, so they were quickly invited in to eat supper, get settled and go to bed. One of the candidates of the sisters who sat with Claire and a few of the other young girls as they ate their late supper remembers that Claire was very quiet. As she later got to know Claire, she would discover how strange and unusual her silence had been. Claire's friend Danielle asked lots of questions and even inquired as to how the candidate had decided to leave everything to become a sister. Claire just observed the joyful environment among the brothers, sisters and young people and families. It was a lot to take in. It was the first time Claire was even aware that Holy Week existed and now she was all of a sudden in a 15th century monastery on a mountain in Spain, out in the middle of nowhere. It was freezing cold. There was no central heating system and it seemed like the stone walls conserved the cold better than the heat and it looked like they were going to spend all their time praying. The following day, Holy Thursday, the full swing of activities began. An hour of prayer in the chapel, a talk on the Eucharist, group discussions, the rosary and the mass of the Lord's Supper in the evening, followed by turns of adoration before the altar of repose. All of this was new to Claire. She managed to get out of most of the activities, spending the time in her room or outside sunbathing and smoking. She was not able to get out of the group discussion that first day, however, since Grace Silao, a young American candidate, was in charge of the group and came looking for her. Father Rafael Alonso, the founder of the Home of the Mother, joined the group meeting and began to ask the young girls questions. Grace translated all that Father said into English. She also tried to translate all that the Irish girls said into Spanish, but it was impossible. She simply could not understand the Derry accent. Can you please try to talk slowly? I can't understand you, she would repeatedly ask the girls, who would laugh, then try again. In the end, two simultaneous translations were needed, from Derry English to American English and American English to Spanish. Despite the difficulties, the group managed to communicate. The subject of the group discussion was the Eucharist. Sister Isabel Cuesta was present in the meeting and describes Claire as apparently very superficial. Sister Isabel continues her description. She behaved like a teenager, only interested in her exterior pose and in making a joke out of everything. She was very witty, but she would make the wisecracks under her breath, causing laughter amongst her Irish friends and giving the impression that she was making fun of something. 
She did not participate in the group reflections. She obviously had nothing to say because she had not been present at the talk and did not share an interest for spiritual things. She never expressed her opinion and did not want to appear interested. She would slouch back exaggeratedly in her chair and giggle with her friends. However, at one point of the discussion, when asked her opinion, she responded, Sorry, but what is the Eucharist? Other than revealing her lack of formation, the question also disclosed the fact that she had not yet understood anything of the discussion. As she had bluntly declared at a previous moment, she did not go to Mass and felt no need to do so. Her friends giggled, but the majority of the group remained in total silence. The candidate who had shared her vocation story in Clare's school in Derry responded to her question with such deep love for our Lord in the Eucharist that Claire did not make a joke out of it. She simply nodded and accepted the clarification. Sister Isabel continues, I think that a crack opened in her heart after this. In a certain way, her supposed ignorance and indifference were opposed. I believe that the truth, as it penetrated her, marked her. She was sufficiently coherent as a person to surrender to the truth and to what was superior. The meeting was suddenly interrupted when a massive landslide crashed down on a nearby picnic area where a group of young children were playing. The children miraculously managed to escape the massive boulders that fell just a few feet away from them. All the participants in the Holy Week encounter gave thanks to the Lord for protecting their little ones. On the following day, Claire was not planning on going to the Good Friday liturgy, but she finally entered the church thanks to the insistence of one of the members of the Irish pilgrimage. Out of respect, you should go in. God died for you today. During the previous days, Claire had seen in this man an authenticity that she truly admired. She perceived that when he spoke about the faith and when he sang and played the guitar, he truly meant what he said and lived it out with sincerity. This moved her to accept his advice, albeit reluctantly. She entered the church and sat down in a pew towards the back. And now let us hear Claire tell us in her own words what happened during the liturgy. It was Good Friday. I attended the liturgy that day with a completely passive attitude. When it was time for everyone to get in line and go up the main aisle of the church for the adoration of the cross, I saw how some made a genuflection and then kissed Jesus' feet nailed to the cross. That was the first time I had seen something like that. I also got in line, not out of piety or fervour, I only did so because it was what everyone else was doing at that moment. When it was my turn, I got on my knees and kissed Jesus' feet. That simple gesture lasted no more than 10 seconds. Kissing the cross, something that apparently seemed so trivial, had a very strong impact on me. Tertullian wrote that there is absolutely nothing which makes men's minds more perplexed about the divine works than the disproportion between the simplicity of the means employed and the grandeur of the effect obtained. I'm not sure how to explain exactly what happened. I didn't see a choir of angels or a white dove flying down toward me, but I experienced the certainty that the Lord was on the cross for me, and along with that certainty I felt a burning pain, similar to what I had experienced when I was little during the way of the cross. Going back to the pew, I had a deep impression in me that I hadn't felt before. I had to do something for him, who had given his life for me. She suddenly found herself alone with Christ alone and realised that all her sins had nailed him to the cross. She had killed God. This idea went through her mind over and over again as she returned to her pew. At the same time, he gently told her, I forgive you. How could she respond but by loving him in return? The only way that I could console what I saw on the cross was my life. I couldn't tell a joke or do a pretty skit to console him. I couldn't do a single thing to console him. I could only give him my life. Despite her embarrassment, as these thoughts went through her mind, she could not stop crying. When the celebration of the Lord's Passion had ended, Grace went to round up her group of girls. She found Claire standing towards the front of the church, trembling and crying. Claire, are you okay? Grace asked. He's died for me. He loves me, Claire responded with her eyes full of sorrow and tears. Yes, Claire, God died for all of us, Grace replied. But Claire again repeated the same phrase. He died for me. He loves me. Grace realised that something very profound was happening in Claire's interior and that she needed to talk with someone who had more experience. Grace had just arrived to the home of the mother a few months before. 
She suggested, do you want to talk to a priest? Claire responded affirmatively and Grace went running to the sacristy to see if she could catch Father Raphael. Father, Claire is crying a lot and she keeps repeating these words to me. He died for me. He loves me. I asked her if she would like to talk to a priest and she said yes. Go call her, he responded as if unsurprised. After asking Claire to come out of the chapel, the three went outside to talk. Claire was still crying profusely. As Grace tried her best to translate the strong dairy accent, Claire shared that she could not understand why no one had ever told her that Jesus had died on the cross for her. She now knew that her sins had put our Lord on the cross. She then confessed, Father, I had planned to be a famous actress, but after this I am confused because I think God wants me to be one of them. Father Raphael asked her, What do you mean by one of them? Claire then pointed to the sisters wearing a habit and said, One of the sisters. The subject of the vocation had come up in the group meeting that morning. After this strong experience with Christ's cross, she felt that she had to give her life entirely to God, and she related this to what had been said that morning about the vocation to the consecrated life. She then ingeniously asked if she could be a famous nun. Father spoke to her about the importance of humility and obedience. And as the conversation continued, he helped her understand the greatness of God's love for her and the immensity of the grace she had received from him. After the conversation with Father Raphael, she ran into a friend and they talked briefly outside the church where Sister Isabel overheard her saying, I love him, I love him. She said it with such sincerity and candidness. She was truly speaking from her heart. Something inexplicable had occurred to Claire that evening. The next activity was a group assembly with all the participants in the retreat to share testimonies and experiences from the day. At one point, Father Raphael asked if Claire could come up and share. She happened not to be present, so Grace had to go look for her. When she arrived, Claire grabbed the microphone and introduced herself. My name is Claire, I'm 17 and I'm from Ireland. In between each sentence, she paused to give time for the translator to transmit her words in Spanish. I'm in team three and today we were talking about vocations and I was thinking, oh my God, I have a vocation, but I want to become famous. Everyone broke into laughter and Claire stood and reveled in the uproar provoked by her statement. Her desire to be famous reminded the sisters and Father Raphael of one of the first three servant sisters. Father Raphael said to Claire, just like Sister Conchi, Claire gave Sister Conchi a thumbs up and continued, but an hour ago, I wanted to become a nun too. So I said to myself, I'll become a famous nun. Once again, there was abundant laughter and Claire smiled, waiting for everyone to calm down before she continued. So I was thinking I would become a famous nun and Father Raphael said to come over for 15 days and stay with the sisters. And I was like, yay. Laughter broke out in you in the hall. The translator skipped the yay and Claire told her to translate it, causing another burst of laughter. So I don't know what to do with myself now. I could become really famous and be really rich, or I could come here and stay with Father Raphael and all the sisters, and I'm praying to God that I make the right decision. She turned to the translator and to ask how to say thank you in Spanish, and then said gracias and waved to the room as she headed to the back. Why had Claire said she wanted to be a famous nun? Years later, she clarified that she was not just trying to make people laugh. It was an expression of her way of thinking at the time. I wanted to become a famous actress, but then after the experience I had that day with the cross, I wanted to be something. I wanted to do something really important for the Lord. And I had seen nuns and I thought, I can become a famous nun. She wanted to do something great for the Lord and greatness for her was naturally tied to fame. She knew nothing of the spiritual life and she did not know that our Lord had said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant or if anyone would be first, he must be last of all. She spontaneously combined her own personal aspirations and this new calling from the Lord. The curious side of things, however, is that Sister Claire would later indeed become a famous nun after her death. St. Therese of Lisieux had said, God has not wished for even one of my desires to not be fulfilled, not only my desires for perfection. And Sister Claire in 2012 copied this quote from St. Claude de la Colombière in her notebook. It is all the more remarkable that the more we submit to God's will, the more he tries to meet our wishes. 
Not only does he answer our prayers, but he even foretells them by granting the very desires we have endeavoured to stifle in our hearts in order to please him, and granting them in a measure we had never imagined. Our Lord would do precisely this with the young Clare's desire to be a famous nun. The Holy Week retreat soon came to an end, but the Irish pilgrimage was to continue. The bus with the 30 Irish pilgrims travelled to northern Spain to stay in a retreat house, the home of the mother has, in Barcelona. They made trips out to Lourdes, Covadonga, Santo Toribio de Lebana, Limpias and Garabandal. As the days went on, Claire felt more and more at home. Her friend Danielle remembers. She was really enjoying it. I couldn't get what she was experiencing because I just wanted to go home. I was completely missing my home comforts. I just felt, oh, this isn't for me. And I remember looking at her and going, are you crazy? She was so quiet at the start. And then all of a sudden she came out of her shell. Father Raphael and some of the servant priests and brothers accompanied the group on some of the outings. Claire would often approach Father Raphael at the front of the bus to ask him questions. Some of the adults were actually worried that she was being impertinent and bothersome. He responded patiently to all her questions. Our Lord was beginning to show her where true happiness could be found, and she saw in Father Raphael the light that could indicate the path. He spoke the truth clearly and without fear. On the last day, a great number of the group entered the home of the mother as lay members. Claire entered the youth group of the home of the mother and made the commitment of an apprentice, which entailed just five minutes of prayer each day. Years later, she would joke, I told the Lord, I want to do something important for you. So I entered as an apprentice in the home of the mother. That's where our path together started, the Lord and I, when I entered as an apprentice. It was the level of commitment children normally took. It was a small first step, but our Lord was willing to patiently wait for her. As they were saying goodbye, Grace asked her, Claire, are you going to come back? With great firmness, she responded, yes, I'm coming back. Father Raphael and the sisters had invited her to join the home for a pilgrimage in August to World Youth Day in Italy, and she was very enthusiastic about attending. After a reluctant beginning, God's grace had begun to transform her and she sincerely desired to return. Mm-hmm.